Look, I believe in one simple truth. You don't have to be superhuman to be a superhero. There are heroes all around us. Heroes of culture, business, philanthropy, and technology. And on this show, I'm going to talk to them all. My name is Joe Anthony, and this is Hero Talk. Welcome to another episode of Hero Talk, the show where we talk to ordinary people doing extraordinary things, heroes of culture, business, technology, and philanthropy who all have one thing in common, they want to change the world. Today I'm here with my friend David Heath, co-founder of uh, social good fashion accessories brand Bombas. Uh, here to talk to us today about uh, this amazing business you got, man. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. I, as you can see, I, I didn't wear any sock. I thought you'd hook me up, uh, man. Did yeah, you we've got some bags for you. <laughs> awesome, uh, awesome. Well, well, look, man, I want to kind of jump into it because uh, I was reading your bio and I was just fascinated. Well, one, we're st seeing such a trend right now in terms of startup companies taking this kind of social good approach. Obviously, Warby Parker, Tom Shoes, and now you guys. But what was really interesting was kind of the product category you chose to kind of uh, own, which yeah. was socks, which I felt was, you know, somewhat <laughs> somewhat different <laughs> than you would think about what you know products would jump out at you right away in terms of things or areas that you can get into. Why socks? I mean, no one ever grew up <laughs> saying that they wanted to run a sock company, like ever. Uh, it's it's certainly not a sexy category by mm -hmm. any means. Um, but uh, the, the impetus for starting the brand, uh, you know, I, early, in early 2011, I was working at a media company mm. uh, and I came across this quote on Facebook that said that socks were the number one most requested clothing item at homeless shelters. Mm. Uh, at first, I didn't see a business there. I just saw a problem. Um, and kind of like a Snapple fact, I found myself just fascinated yeah. by telling people this fact and seeing their response. And uh, I saw that people would respond the same way that I did, which was a little bit of intrigue, but also a little bit of you know, uh, disappointment that this is a real thing. Mm. Um, and the more and more I started to think about it, uh, at the time, you know, Warby was about eight months old and yeah. getting a ton of press and fanfare. And Tom's was in their sixth year of business and doing incredibly well. And I just kind of had this like, aha moment of like, oh, maybe I can use this one for one business model to solve this sock problem. Mm. And so why did you have some kind of previous connection to homelessness or that as an issue that moved you you know, so much to want to start this business? Or? I mean, not directly, but mm -hmm. I don't think anybody living in New York City, yeah. uh, and, and unfortunately I think in a lot of big cities uh, throughout this country uh, have ever not ex come in contact with homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on my way to work every day, uh, I must interact with probably three to 10 homeless people. Uh, so it's something that was in my backyard. Uh, and once I started to learn more about homelessness and, mm. uh, and kind of the rampant rise that it's been, I mean, New York City is the highest homelessness rate yeah. that it's ever had yeah. uh, with almost 60,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given night. Uh, and, and that statistic is not uh, unique to New York. I know that LA has its biggest homelessness problem. Detroit has the biggest homelessness problem. San Francisco has their biggest homelessness problem. Uh, so this is, this is definitely an issue that has continued yeah. to raise. And, just was at the forefront of uh, of, of what was. Yeah, you know, and I was, I was actually excited about. to talk to you because my my father was homeless for twenty five years. Yeah, and um, you know it's something that you know you take for granted every day when you walk by and you see um, some people and you think about okay, well they call they need a coat or they definitely need shoes. And, but there's just basic basic things, whether it be hygienic or in your case, socks, yeah. that um, are overlooked as kind of uh, just basic day-to-day -day needs that uh, they suffer from, uh, from not having right. access and, to. And these people are actually overlooked as, mm -hmm. as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, I find, you know, I found that, you know, if I don't have socks with me or if I don't have some money to give somebody, mm -hmm. uh, just a simple acknowledgement of, hey, yeah, hello, so hi, hope you're having a good day. You see their face go from this to this. And it's, you know, because a lot of times we're so used to seeing it in New York that we kind of put our blinders yeah. on. Uh, and, are and we desensitized right to homeless? Is that homelessness? Because uh, it's uh, so much in our face now? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah I do. But, but I'm also, you know, uh, in incredibly, uh, you know, 
I feel so good about the future because I think as my exposure to this community mm. through my work, uh, I've been able to witness so many incredible organizations that are doing so many incredible mm. things. We donate office space to one of these organizations. It's called Back on My Feet. Oh, wow. uh, I actually ran the marathon with them last year here in New York. And what they do is they help transition people out of homelessness for the, uh, through the discipline of running. Mm. Uh, so they'll go to different homelessness shelters, sign people up for a running program. If they commit to a 30-day running program and then stick with the team after, Afterwards, they'll start to provide uh, assistance with them uh, in housing services and financial services and job placements. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fascinating organization mm -hmm. that's doing a really unique thing uh, to tackle this issue. And there's so many examples, uh, wonderful examples of organizations. That, that's incredible. There. That's incredible. What are some of the challenges of building a business that has such a, a, a strong social good, buy one, give one type of uh, business model, right? Yeah. Um, do you have to rely on your own distribution channels? Are you being braced by kind of traditional retailers? You know, um, is there a perception around quality sometimes when you have a business that has such a strong philanthropic component where the quality may not be as good because sure. you have to suffer profit margins to some degree because you have this kind of uh, give back, um, I guess, uh, cost line item that's yeah. built into it? I think one of the fascinating things is that our mission was built into the company from, from day one. Uh, and, you know, we kind of, when we were developing the business plan, we, we kind of answered the question, we're like, okay, if we want to donate a lot of socks, that means we've got to sell a lot of socks. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're not going to sell a lot of socks if we don't have a really great product or something that's mm -hmm. unique in the marketplace. So then we started to tackle the, what, where are we going to play? How are we going to differentiate ourselves? And so we spent two years on product development and really came at it from the consumer's lens to try to think about what are all the areas that we can fix in your everyday socks. Mm -hmm. We don't just hang our hat on, well, we're a mission company, so that's why you should buy our product. We truly believe that we produce the best socks in the history of feet. Uh, and here we are <laughs> three and a half years later, uh, almost $50 million of revenue this year. That's awesome. Um, man. <laughs> and you know, the proof is kind of in the yeah. pudding that uh, people really respond well, incredibly well to our product, but uh, also to our mission. Um, as far as the cost line items standpoint, you know, we're an entirely direct to consumer business, mm -hmm. so we've cut out the middleman. Uh, so we're able to use a lot of that margin that we would otherwise give to a third party retailer and use that to put towards their donation product. That's awesome. And it's the majority of your consumer base. We talk a lot about millennials at our agency. We, we focus on millennials and uh, we talk about this idea of uh, kind of social capitalism and, and purpose and uh, brands that actually stand for something, um, that equity translates into uh, a really clear point of difference as well as a value proposition that these consumers look for, yeah. right? Um, do you find that the majority of your consumer base is within that kind of age demographic and shares those kind of millennial principles? Surprisingly or? not. Really? Um, wow. We, okay. have, we have an incredibly <laughs> even distribution, almost like 25% between every uh, age demographic okay. from you know 18 to 24, 24 to 34, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, we're 50-50 men, women, uh, and we're pretty evenly distributed among uh, salary incomes as well. Uh, I think you know if, if there's any benefit of the tumultuous times that we live in mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody is looking for something that just makes them feel a little bit better, that there's some hope in the world. Um, and so, you know, our brand positioning uh, was always around inclusivity rather mm. than exclusivity. You take the brands like Nike and Under Armour, you know, of the world, and they're always like, you have to be the best, you have yeah. to be the, the most elite, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is, you know, it works really well for them. But, you know, we position ourselves as almost the anti Under Armour, right? Yeah. We're like, we don't care if you get the best time in the marathon, mm. as long as you got up and actually did it, yeah. uh, you know, that's enough for us. And so this mindset around <laughs> inclusivity, I think, has really allowed us to adopt a very wide audience. It's interesting you say that because we've been giving a lot of talks and having a lot of conversations with uh, the luxury industry and industries that kind of built their business off of this idea of being exclusive or being elitist, where you can be elite, but just don't be elitist. Right. Right. And so now we're seeing a lot of these industries have to pivot on a dime now to kind of redefine what elite means or what luxury means to be something that's more inclusive as consumers continue to self-actualize and kind of develop their own sense of self-worth and equity that they don't have to derive from associating with badge brands like they did before. Um, but despite that, I look at your product and it's really well designed. So are people finding your product first because they're looking for really swagged out socks, right? 
<laughs> and then they're pleasantly surprised that you have this social good mission, or is it is it the opposite? I think it's 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 this fine balance between the two, and I have to give a real nod to our branding team, mm -hmm. uh, which you know we've kind of we've kind of built this internal agency model where mm -hmm. my co-founder came out of the branding agency okay. world. Um, we that worked helps. together at this media <laughs> company, and so we look at everything we do through the lens of the brand. Mm -hmm. and, and the two pillars we have are incredible product and mission that gives back to the community. Mm -hmm. And so it's finding this interesting balance where if you look at our product detail page, for instance, uh, you've got all the features of the benefits of the sock, but right next to our quantity counter as you drop down, it says, and that's X number of pairs donated. Mm -hmm. So we weave the story in you know, naturally throughout the customer ex experience mm -hmm. uh, life cycle. Uh, we balance out our, our emails that are announcing our new sock lines with an email about something that me and my team just did on the giving side. Um, so it's, it's really this, this mix between mm -hmm. content and commerce uh, that it's, it's really not one leads the other. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the macro trends right now that you're seeing in the fashion industry that one you're trying to avoid, right? Because we're seeing kind of major brands closing retail doors and um, just the, all of these kind of direct to consumer brands that sure. are launching right now are really eating everyone's lunch because they understand digital behavior um, so well. They're using machine learning, they're using AI, they're using you know a variety of different kind of emerging technologies to predict what you'll want. Um, how are you? staying ahead of the curve to make sure that you are adopting and utilizing the best practices to continue to engage that consumer? And what are you learning from kind of some of the, uh, uh, the brands that are doing it wrong right now to ensure that you're insulating yourself from not necessarily falling victim to the same uh, sure. issues? I think one of the things is that, you know, from a product design perspective, mm -hmm. uh, we don't design based on trend. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to be a fad. We don't, we, you know, we want we want slow, steady, healthy growth mm -hmm. over a long period of time. You know, we decided when we started this business, this wasn't something we wanted to build a rocket ship in five years, sell the company and move on and do our next thing. You know, we've got a 25, 35, 50 year horizon. You know, the founder of Patagonia is this, you know, he's always said, he said, I want to build a business that'll be here a hundred mm -hmm. years from now, mm -hmm. which is why he's not so focused on quarterly profit earnings and all the rest of it, why Patagonia will never go uh, public. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one angle. Um, on the other side, I think we're also, it's, it's a really amazing time to be a brand right now, mm -hmm. um, especially a brand online, because you can use the digital medium by which to tell your story and really engage your customers. I'm sure you've seen all the, mm -hmm. you know, the research that we've seen, which is, the millennial customers, but I also think that millennial mindset is is outside it's, of just it's that age creating range. a radius, yeah, ripple. They effect. want a connection to yeah. something, yeah. right? And they yeah. don't want to feel like a cog in the machine. You know, you look at Michael Dubin, the founder of Dollar Shave Club. Mm -hmm. He was in the ads. You mm -hmm. know, he was mm -hmm. talking about this is why I started this company because I think shavers are too expensive, mm -hmm. so I want to produce a cheaper razor. Um, and I think people want to have that. Yeah. You know. It's, it's so fascinating how many people I say, like, you know, Phil Knight to, and they're yeah. like, who? And I'm like, the founder of one of the biggest apparel companies in the world. Uh, you yeah. don't know Phil Knight? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, and why I still think fast-growing brands like Amazon, people know who Jeff Bezos mm -hmm. are, yeah. Apple, right? Mm -hmm. People knew who Steve Jobs mm -hmm. was. Um, I think if you look at the, at the DNA of the brands that exist today and the brands that are succeeding, Tom's, Blake mm -hmm. Mankowski, like, mm -hmm. people know these names mm -hmm. because they feel a connection to the brand mm -hmm. that goes beyond, anybody can produce a really good product. Yeah. Anybody, yeah. right? Yeah. A product differentiator is not defensible. Brand in the apparel space and brand in the consumer space is truly the one thing that is ultimately defensible. Conversely though, do you think that same approach worked for The Honest Company with Jessica Alba? You know, because she wasn't in the ads, you know, and uh, there are some people that kind of question the kind of validity and authenticity there. Um, but it obviously started from this place of truth and a desire to kind of develop a better product. Yeah. Um, something that was uh, engineered um, to give moms, you know, a sense of comfort, you know, that they were providing their kids with the most safe hyperallergenic products that were yeah. out there. Um, do you think? that that level of authenticity um, and connection can be engineered 
now? Or because obviously you have all these big legacy companies that are going to try and draft off of your best practices sure. to figure out how they can create that human element yeah. that they've been missing so that whether you know the CEO or the founder of my company or not, maybe my brand can have its own story that has its own resonance, mm -hmm. resonance uh, that can potentially subsidize the need for some kind of backstory on, on, uh, on with a, an executive who has such an endemic connection to the product. I think it. I think it is. It, I think it is really hard to yeah. to, to engineer. Um, and you look at you look at you look at Uber as a great example, mm -hmm. right? Amazing meteoric rise. But as soon as the authenticity of like, mm -hmm. what's the real purpose that you're yeah. driving into this brand? Is it is it profits above all costs? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. not, I don't care about a socially diverse workplace. Mm -hmm. I don't really care about women's rights and all these other things. And you can probably ride that for a long, a not long enough time. But we live in this super transparent society now yeah. with social media yeah. and you look at what what that's done to take over governments in in other parts of the world uh is now taking down businesses yeah. uh and enforcing you know key level executives to resign from their businesses at the peak of their growth yeah. um so so I, I don't think that it can be engineered and i mm. think that you know, authenticity is, is, is going to be a key driver for any brand going forward. Especially with the democratization of, of distribution. Sure. Right? right? It was one thing about controlling shelf space, right? right? If I control shelf space, I can control the market, right? right? And that used to be, and it, it, even you've been on Shark Tank, that's the one thing I keep hearing the sharks say, oh, how are you going to get on shelf space? How are you going to get on shelf space? It's like shelf space doesn't matter anymore. Like people will find what they want to buy and align with the brands that they want to align with if the story is, is relevant. Look at Burt's Bees, look yeah. at Tito's Vodka. Yeah, It's the ugliest bottle in the world, the sorry worst, Tito. And the worst name too. <laughs> yeah. I remember when somebody first told me that I was gonna have Tito's Vodka, I was like, <laughs> what is that, in a 99 cent like plastic bottle next to the pop-up? Exactly. And now it's, I asked for it by name. And he's got this bathtub gin kind of vibe, he's sitting on his porch with his Labrador and yeah. you're like, I just make great candy yeah. vodka. And you're like, you know what, I dig it. Yeah. Um, now it's awesome. I mean, it's really, to your point, it is an exciting time to be an entrepreneur with a brand idea that's really steeped in something that's authentic because, um, one, if there is a market need for it and you do have an authentic story that you can tie to it, you can break through and that's what's really incredible. But let's back up a minute, right? Sure. Because um, you saw this Salvation Army ad, you were moved. I mean, you got with your co-founder. So, what was the first step like? If we we're going to make this company, I mean, how did, what was the progression, right, to get to that point where you were like, all right, here are the building blocks. It's neither were, you were guys were in media. You weren't in fashion. No, we weren't in fashion. Right. So, like, what were the first steps that kind of got you to a point where you're like, all right, we're ready to do this? And were you doing it while you were still working? Did you kind of quit, dive deep into it? Give me the give me the background yeah, story. Yeah, so uh, I, I remained working for two years uh, as we were kind of ideating on this process. But the first thing that that I wanted to do is I wanted to actually get close to the to the mission. And so I started volunteering at homelessness shelters. Uh, I started carrying socks in my backpack, and mm. you know. I remember this very vivid story of this, uh, you know, I was walking up Fifth Avenue uh, outside Madison Square Park between 23rd and 24th Street, uh, and there's a homeless vet on the street, and he's, you know, he said, anything will do, and I said, hey, I don't have any money, but I got a clean pair of socks, and he was like, how did you know that this is what I need? Took off his shoes, on one foot he had a plastic bag that he had wrapped around his foot, and on another foot he had taken off his bandana and used that as a sock, and that was the moment where I was like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is like a real need. It's not just something. And these were your socks at the time, or were they? No, no, no. Really, I was just going out and buying wow. socks that because wow. I wanted to see if it was real. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to like. I wanted to live it. I wanted to experience it. Um, and from that moment on, actually, we've carried that 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 moment that I had. Uh, every new employee that we hire, we give ten pairs of our donation socks to, and they're required to hand them out in their first week because That's we want awesome. them to have those one-on-one -on -one experiences mm -hmm. uh, that go beyond just show up to a yeah. soup kitchen. You know, help. You know, we want them to make sure they yeah. have that that unified connection. But as far as you know, developing the idea. Um, you know, you're right. I had no, I had no manufacturing experience, and I remember very fortuitously I told my dad about the idea over dinner one night about three months into this process, uh, and he was like, "You know, your godfather was actually in in the sock business for like 40 years," and he's like, "I think he did really, really well." Um, did you so know this? I had no idea, no idea, complete That's stroke wild. of luck. Uh, and it turns out that he actually ran a company called Gold Toe in the in the late 80s, oh. early 90s, <laughs> yeah. which was like a multi-billion-dollar. <laughs> 
sock company, uh, and then left and started his own private label manufacturing okay. company. Uh, so, so he's his knowledge in the space is incredible. He helped walk us into some of the best factories okay. in the world and really walk us through the manufacturing process. So awesome. we cut an incredibly lucky break with that one. Uh, we then we spent two years on product development, and I actually think the fact that we didn't have any manufacturing or fashion experience allowed us to tackle the product from the consumer's mindset. Mm. You know, really say like, I don't care about cost. I just want to produce the best product possible. Mm -hmm. um, and two years later, uh, we launched the business and you know, we have the product that we have today because of that story. So your story just keeps getting better because <laughs> you, you, you lucked out, you know, your grandfather was like, Stock, uh, sock tycoon, right? And yeah, now Godfather, the Godfather yeah. socks, right? Oh, I'm sorry, the Godfather. But yeah, it's, it's Godfather socks yeah. too. Um, then you go on Shark Tank and you land a deal with Damon John. So yeah. I mean, first, why Shark Tank? Um, how did that kind of fall in your lap? Was it a decision like you were watching it one day? We got to go on this thing, or? So I was a I was a huge fan, obviously, of the show. But uh, you know, I, I've been a big believer of you know go after the things that you can control. In yeah. your, you know, I talked to so many entrepreneurs. They're like, the first investment I'm going to make is in PR, because yeah. uh, all I need to do is get on the New York Times or on Good Day, you know, Good Morning America, and then my business is set. I'm like, but you can't control that, right? Yeah. You know, go after the things you know you can control, because uh, any PR company that says they'll guarantee you a New York Times, you should run in the other direction, because mm -hmm. nobody has that type of leverage over them. Um, so we'd actually launched the business on Indiegogo, uh, one of the crowdfunding oh, yeah. platforms. Uh, right. And we did incredibly well. We had about $142,000 in sales in our first uh, 30 days. Uh, because of that, Shark Tank actually found us. Mm. Um, and so we didn't go to any open casting mm. calls. You know, they have a recruiting team. Uh, and they, they called us and they said, hey, would you be interested in being on the show? And we were like, uh, of course. Mm. Uh, and so kind of went through that whole process and uh, ended up filming in uh, June of 2014, about seven months after we had launched the business on Indiegogo. Uh, and then got a complete stroke of luck, they end up airing our episode on the season premiere. Some people have to wait a full year to find out if they're even gonna be on it, because they air they film like 200 people and only show about 100. Mm. Uh, so there's real, like, you can't plan for it. Yeah. Um, so you're really gonna You like, don't know if you're gonna make it, yeah. You have no idea. Um, and, and even so, if they cut the deal with you? Even if you cut a deal. All right, but you still get the deal, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope, I mean, in our case, I, I don't know. I can't speak for anybody else, but in our case, it we aired, out. got the deal. Uh, Good. It's been incredible. Great, great, yeah. great, great. So um, has uh, he been hands-on? I mean, is it a situation where like he comes in every once in a while? It's like, how's my investment doing? What's yeah, that? <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, he really serves as a, a kind of a, an advisory role yeah. for us. I mean, yeah. we've been growing like a rocket ship ever since. And, uh, you know, it's in, and he'll tell you this too. He's like, you guys are the new age. He's like, I'm the old school. I know mm. retail and I know yeah. wholesale, but because we're not really doing that, um, you know, he, he actually leans on us to ask us about you know, e-commerce techniques yeah, that, yeah. that we're dealing with. Uh, but he's been an incredible, you know, sounding board as a leader, as a yeah. mentor yeah. Uh, for how do we grow the organization? How do we think about capitalization? Uh, when is the right time to bring in, you know, a strategic partner, you know, who can help take the business from 50 million to 500 million. Yeah. Um, and, and he's also been, you know, he's been a megaphone. Uh, yeah. you know, every opportunity yeah. he gets, whether it's the front cover Inc. magazine to his daily appearances on Good Morning America, he's always talking about our brand and seeding it. And it's just another touch point for the consumers to keep us as top of mind. That's awesome. I mean, uh, you know, we worked with him on that surfboard brand. Yeah. <laughs> so seeing him on yeah, the surfboard yeah. was very interesting. But talk about an authentic story and somebody to work with uh, that has such an authentic backstory who, like, mortgaged his house and, you know, had a dream, kind of disrupted the fashion industry, was able to even now kind of reinvent himself to be this kind of conciliary and whisperer to, you know, entrepreneurs like yourself yeah. uh, and provide valuable feedback as well as um, who is kind of um, proud enough to know what he knows, but humble enough to know what he doesn't. And that makes uh, every good leader, right? Absolutely. I think every good leader is, is, you know, is confident in what they know, but also will admit when they don't know something. 
So three million socks given away so far, man. That's yeah, amazing. Just Congratulations. Over. Yeah. So are all of these socks going to the homeless, or do they go to different types of people in need? No. So so predominantly the homeless. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we say in need. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have a special partnership with. Uh, the VA, so not necessarily mm -hmm. all homeless veterans, mm -hmm. but every veteran that comes back uh, is given a care package with one of our socks when they return home. Oh, that's awesome. um, we have a partnership with the Special Olympics and their Fit Feet program uh, to help educate them on you know foot hygiene, and so we include a pair of our socks. But I'd say about 98% of, of mm -hmm. all of our donations uh, go to the homeless shelters. We have a, a charity network of over 700 different charity partners throughout the throughout the United States. All 50 states are covered. Uh, and again, part of our brand story was wanting to make sure that we were giving back to the you know the people in our community in our backyard. Mm -hmm. So when you make a purchase, and whether you're in Indiana or you're in Alaska or you're in Hawaii, uh, you know that your product is is coming you know back to your community. Uh, and I think that was just a really important thing, and we hear really great feedback from our customers on you know the idea that we're closing the loop and and you know donating here uh, domestically. That's in the awesome. US. That's what, is is the majority of your business domestic, or are you selling all over the world right now? Majority of our our, our sale business is, is here mm -hmm. in the U.S. Uh, again, we feel like there's there's a lot to tackle here. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I learned really early on from mentors like Damon and uh, and Blake and other people uh, that I've leaned on uh, is focus. You know, mm -hmm. really doing one thing incredibly well uh, and it's funny you think you know when you're in the early days you're like we sold a million dollars you're like we're huge and you're like nobody knows about you um, I saw this amazing article with Casper came out the other day and, you know the reason that they had taken you know I think 170 million dollars of funding and Philip you know is sitting there being like nobody knows what Casper is still right and they're doing 250 million dollars of revenue yeah it's incredible. It's incredible. No, it, it, it takes time and, and it's all relative, you know. I mean, you can get up and, I mean, $50 million is nothing to sneeze at. No, <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, I'm blown away <laughs> at where we are today, yeah. but, uh, but there's still a drive to go bigger. Absolutely. And, you know, want to, and do and more the bigger good. that we get, the, the more good that we can do. I mean, we're going to, you know, eventually probably expand into other product categories. That was and, my next question. What's next? Hosiery? Uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're not ready to announce it yet, yeah, yeah, okay. um, but, uh, but, but you know, the long-term vision is for mm -hmm. Bombas to be a lifestyle apparel company okay. uh, rooted in comfort um, uh, to, get, to give back to the community. Got so, it. you know, it, it wouldn't be shocking if one day we had sweatpants and sweatshirts and t-shirts mm -hmm. and underwear, but uh, as far as what we're doing next, it's a little And are you working on any kind of patentable technology um, that kind of goes into the, you know, the making of your products where it's more breathable or, I mean, is that an important part of like how you engineer your... So, so patenting in the apparel industry is incredibly challenging, mm -hmm. um, mostly because all you have to do is change the, <laughs> the direction of the stitch and all of a yeah. sudden it, your patent is, is invalid. Uh, we do have a design patent on our honeycomb arch support mm -hmm. um, and you know we will look for things that are defensible but frankly again we'd rather take that time energy and money and invest it in our brand yeah. uh, and, and really give give something to, for people to be proud of. Uh, you know, there's the great example of, you know, Skechers created Bob's shoes, yep. uh, which was a total direct knockoff of Tom's shoes. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and they got <laughs> annihilated in the marketplace. I mean, people were, and I think they said like, we'll donate two shoes for every one donated. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Again, when there's this when there's this inauthenticity, uh, I think consumers and and the media they no, it, they it know it right. Yeah. They they know if you're just trying to do it, uh, you know, to make a buck. Yeah, um, I think we're starting to see that in a lot of other industry, the beer industry. Uh, they try to create their own craft beer brands and things like that, and try and fabricate some kind of story behind it. It's well, they've got to do something, right? <laughs> because they're you know I, there was this great story I I, uh, I learned about Budweiser. They have a team of people internally. <laughs> that are designed to create brands that ultimately take market share away from Bud and Bud Light. Yeah. Which is like they're they're incubating their own cannibalization, <laughs> but it, it, it's what forces their other brands to be reactive and try to think about ways to safeguard them against uh, and the, the new incumbents in the space. Well, David, you definitely are a marketer, and I can talk to you all day about this stuff, man. Me as well. And you, you're, doing, Clearly. you're doing amazing work, man. Congratulations on over three million pairs of socks uh, um, given away. I've Thank learned you. a lot. Um, I'm definitely going to support the brand and let my people know about it. Appreciate it. I'm Joe Anthony. This is David Heath, co-founder of Bombas. He's definitely a hero.